So my personal hope is that out of Rio and with the help of the opinion makers, we will create incentives and yes, pressure to accelerate uh, corporate sustainability so that the majority of companies actually embraces green, clean, inclusive growth so that chambers of commerce become chambers of sustainability. Nice, Kumi. Greenpeace is here in several of the three tracks that George mentioned. Uh, we have a team that's inside the formal negotiations where we are lobbying different country delegations on different areas of the uh, conversation around oceans, around uh, sustainable energy, uh, green economy and so on. But we have decided to put more of our energy in the People Summit where we are hosting a range of different activities using this opportunity to build alliances with faith leaders, with indigenous peoples, with women's movements and so on because we never came to Rio thinking that in three days we will find the solution to the world we want. We knew that the struggle would continue and we're seeing this as a basis for ongoing um, work. We also connected with a, a lot of people around the world. Yesterday, uh, together with 350.org and a range of other groups, we did a Twitter storm. You might have seen this. One of the terrible ironies and one simple thing that governments could do is at the moment, governments spend several hundred billion dollars of taxpayer money in what are called fossil fuel subsidies that go to oil, coal, and gas companies. And already three years ago, the G20 agreed that they would scrap them. But up to now, they have not made one step in that direction. And so we ran this thing yesterday on Twitter, uh, calling on people to participate around the world, calling on governments to actually move away from um, the fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, I maybe should extend the invitation to those of you who are here in Rio. We also have our ship, the Rainbow Warrior, um, in Rio, and people are invited to come and uh, visit it. Just to show how mad governments can sometimes be, I'd like to remind you that the French government sent intelligence agents to bomb that earlier version of the ship in Auckland Arbor 26 years ago. Um, and so we're very proud of a ship that still stands. Uh, uh, well, it's not the same one. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that will happen tomorrow will be a big march through the streets of uh, Rio where we hope to bring urgency and, and more ambition to the political leaders in the final days of the negotiations. So, so talk for a minute about the Twitter storm yesterday, which is you know, a really interesting thing for you guys to be doing. How do you know if that's working? You know, one of the challenges with social media is we see that the criticism is it's a lot of noise, not a lot of action. That's always a criticism. Tell us how you're taking that on, in the sense yesterday you engaged a whole bunch of people around the world, but how is the world different today? Well, I think firstly, a lot of people in the world didn't know that in fact our governments use taxpayer money in subsidies to actually fund harmful energy options. If that same money would go to renewable energy, we could have a seismic shift in terms of the problem. So what we saw, the way you measure it in a way, is um, the numbers of people. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't know offhand right now how large uh, it broke various records by the end of yesterday. Um, then we also try to consciously uh, build in creative elements where people can take their own actions. So we advise people of how they could take the broad sort of message, design their own ads and so on. And people uh, I've seen on my Facebook page, for example, various uh, people doing it. I mean, you know, the, just to make a broader point about how one thinks about social media and conventional activism, uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, online activism or cyber activism is actually slacktivism, you know, that people just are sitting there and going, clicking buttons and so on. Now, I just would say that if you are doing online activism in Syria or if you're doing it in Egypt, nobody could actually accuse you of doing slacktivism, right? You were using it. But I do think the challenge, which is in your question, is how do you connect online and offline activism? So I can give you uh, many examples of how Greenpeace does it. 
in the sense that we can initiate a campaign. For example, right now we have uh, a campaign against Kentucky Fried Chicken for buying their packaging from newly deforested timber in the Indonesian rainforest. And so there's various online actions that people can take. And, but there's also a recommended set of actions that people can volunteers, even people who are not directly connected with Greenpeace can actually take. So people have been going and painting outside KFC stores in Holland, for example, uh, a tiger, uh, tiger shapes, because one of the implications of the Indonesian rainforest destruction is the extinction of the Sumatran tigers. So just to give you an example, you have to have, I think, an a, a offline conventional way so that those with power can actually feel uh, pressure to change. So I want to come back to Greenpeace in a minute, but, but Georg, you wrote a really interesting piece in the Herald Tribune in the run-up to Rio, all about what we're trying to do and what we're going to get done, and there was a line in that which I thought was really important, where you talked about the influence of social media narrative on big business. So to flip it to the other side, how is social media changing the lives of the people you work with every day? It is quite a lot. I, business has totally shifted attention to social media. Social media means young future consumers, opinion makers in the making, uh, a huge shift towards attention on social media. I also believe that and uh, social media is very important in creating awareness and spreading knowledge and being the entry point for something. Uh, I'm struck often that uh, the world is, is sleeping at the wheel because we all know that we are heading towards uh, huge disruptions in many ways. We also know that in politics we are probably not going in the right direction. Governments are constrained. They're busy with crisis management. There is what you could call an absence of long-term forward-looking opinion making. And uh, I hope that multilateral cooperation will soon overcome that big gap. And I hope that people everywhere will feel that it's important again to build what connects us. That's what multilateralism ultimately is about. We are currently going in a very dangerous direction, a kind of selfish, inward-oriented behavior, uh, both, I would argue, at the individual level, but also at the nation-state level, defines the course of action. And we forget about what connects us, the planet, the natural resources, but also the ability to create wealth and to include the poor in the marketplace. The multilateral trade is in a deep freezer. Nobody seems to worry. That to me is extremely worrisome. It means the world is hopefully not repeating the mistakes of history that led to disasters, but we are certainly going in a direction that is not stressing the importance of investing in what connects us. Increasingly, you hear voices of division, populism, inward orientation. Walls are being built instead of tearing them down. So I'm also concerned about the overall direction. And there, I hope that social media will create awareness and connect, because in the end, it's about building bridges between nations, people, private sector, civil society, because in the end we need cooperation. Without collaboration and cooperation at all levels, we cannot make the quantum leap we need to make. So tell me about the developing world, because you, you spoke about that, which is we think a lot about the social media narrative and we think a lot about Rio. How is it we make sure the developing world is part of that conversation? Well, already it is. I mean, our own organization, we are thriving uh, in all emerging markets and actually uh, a lot of innovation also has shifted uh, from traditional centers to the east, to the south. Uh, the beauty with technology is, is the diffusion of knowledge and the lowering of barriers. And that is true on technology, on access to information. When I was an engineer in Tanzania, uh, guiding young engineers, and together we built up something uh, 35 years ago, we had to really decodify documents which were shipped by airplane to know how to build a processing plant for fruits and to how to manufacture soap. Today, you can access that knowledge within two seconds. Uh, so the transaction costs are so much lower. That means the opportunities for, for creativity are so much higher. And that's really the beauty. And that's, I think, the good news, uh, that is access to opportunities, the barriers are so much lower. I think the old paradigm of north-south doesn't really hold anymore. 
innovation is happening everywhere. Look at Brazil, most of the big social innovations are actually happening here, uh, from cash transfer to loose para todo, which are now making the round around the world. And I can quote you many other examples. This is the new world we live in, and social media, I believe, is part of it. And also companies, by the way, they have gone global, and that means you no longer have your traditional R&D protected somewhere in Massachusetts alone. No, you have your R&D now in Bangalore, in China, and everywhere else, because you want to source knowledge and know-how from everywhere.